and it completely transformed her anxiety. She understood which days she was going to be at school, which days she was going to see her dad for dinner, when we were going to see the therapist. It was it was a game changer. Like I didn't realize how many things were swirling around in her little head. Ever feel like you suck at this job? Motherhood, I mean. Have too much anxiety and not enough patience. Too much yelling, not enough play. There's no manual, no village, no guarantees. The stakes are high. We want so badly to get it right. But this is survival mode. We're just trying to make it to bedtime. So if you're full of mom guilt, your temper scares you. You feel like you're screwing everything up and you're afraid to admit any of those things out loud. This podcast is for you. This is Failing Motherhood. I'm Danielle Batman, and each week we'll chat with a mom ready to be real, sharing her insecurities, her fears, her failures, and her wins. We do not have it all figured out. That's not the goal. The goal is to remind you, you are the mom your kids need. They need what you have, you are good enough, and you're not alone. I hope you pop in earbuds, somehow sneak away, and get ready to hear some hope from the trenches. You belong here, friend. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to Failing Motherhood. My name is Danielle Bettman, and on today's episode, I'm joined by Sarah Olsher. As a writer, illustrator, and speaker, Sarah spends her life creating book and visual calendar kits for kids at Mighty and Bright and talking about things that make many people want to crawl into a deep, dark hole. Whether it's divorce, cancer, death, or uncertainty, she's worked hard to be comfortable with the profoundly uncomfortable. Her work has been featured in Pop Sugar, Romper, Reader's Digest, The Mighty, and Good Housekeeping, to name a few. And she's spoken in front of audiences large and small about how to handle major life changes like divorce and cancer. She truly believes that every one of us has the strength and resilience to overcome unimaginable hardship and use our lessons to make this world a much better place. She's the author of six children's books about divorce, cancer, and other changes. And you guys... I cannot wait for you to hear this episode. I am Sarah's biggest fan, even though we just met, and we were instant friends on this episode. It is so much fun for me to get to share a product that is created and made by a woman-owned business like her, and it's something that I absolutely wish I would have come upon years ago for my daughters. It's something that I'll be recommending to all of my one-on-one clients, and it's just straight up genius and brilliant, and she has so much to offer families that are just game changers. They just are, with no type of exaggeration behind it. So um, I can't wait to hear for you to hear her story, and definitely go check out her website at the end. It's at the, in the show notes, but it's so good. It's so good, you guys. Without further ado, I will introduce this episode for you. Welcome, Sarah. So excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I love everything you do. (laughs) Oh, thanks so much. Ah. Well, we connected on Instagram like not too long ago, and I instantly fell in love with what you have created, and I had to know more, so I just invited you on the show. And I'm so new to you and your story that I just can't wait to ask you all the questions and dive in. But most importantly, have you ever felt like you were failing motherhood? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of from day one, I think I did. Um, yeah, I feel like you know I was thinking about this last week about you know how it's just not a not at all what I was expecting. In both positive and negative ways, I think the positive is my mom told me, like, you're not going to – it's going to change your whole perspective on life. Like, this amount of love you will not have experienced before. You are the best thing I ever did. And I was like, whatever, mom. Like, that's kind of sad if a kid is the best (laughs) thing you ever did. And then I had my daughter and was like, oh, my God, you're the best thing I ever did. I love you. (laughs) Like, I want to squish your body into my body. Um, so <laughs> yep, <I'm there. laughs> in that way, it was like so unexpected. And then the other was just like, 
oh my God, this is so hard. And it started from the beginning. I mean, my daughter had colic and I couldn't get it to stop. And I ended up cutting all these things out of my diet because every time I would nurse her, she would be screaming in pain. Oh. And then she had terrible anxiety. And the real kicker was when she was in first grade and I learned she had a hearing loss that we did not know that she had what? from birth. What? Yes. And that that was probably a big cause of her anxiety was like, poor kid had been at home. It was quiet here. She could hear me, understand everything I was saying. Then when I went through a divorce, when she was a year and a half old, I had to go work outside of our house. And I had to put her in daycare and she cried all day, every day, oh. until she was literally kicked out of daycare. No. And I was just like, I felt like I was failing all over the place because I was like, I literally collapsed crying outside on the sidewalk out in front of the daycare. And my mom was like, all right, girl, we're going to pick you up. We have to do what we have to do. You know, oh. you have to, you have to work and this has to happen. Um, but when I found out she had that hearing loss, it was like, oh my God. Like everything she had been through, I felt terrible. terrible. Yeah. Oh, so all the coulda, woulda, shoulda is that you like, that's the nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know how she passed her hearing test when she was born. You know? Yeah. How but did you find it at first grade? In kindergarten, she failed her hearing test, but we thought it was her anxiety and that she was afraid to make a wrong answer. Mm. Then when she failed it again in first grade, they were like, you know, it's probably anxiety, but you never know. So they sent her to an audiologist and the audiologist was like, no, she did a great job reporting exactly what she could hear and she can't hear. So oh, no. I was like, oh, for crying out loud, that's really, oh, <sighs> you know, yeah, bad, bad mom alert, bad, all yeah. the things, oh. all the things. And I think the thing that has really kept me going because I, it's just like one thing after another. We, I've basically been in survival mode for the past 10 years, actually 15 years. My daughter is 10. And I would say the thing that is keeping me going is basically just trying not to look back on it and do the mm -hmm. coulda, shoulda, what is because mm -hmm. I can't they fix don't serve it. You. No. All we, yeah. All I can do is the next best thing. Oh, man. So... The, let's circle back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> divorce. What was it? Yeah. Tell us that story. So I was married for five years before we had my daughter. And my husband and I just like, we were not on the same page about anything. We were young. I mean, at least I was an idiot in my 20s. I recognize that this is not um, this is not young for a lot of people, but um, we met when I was 22. He was 28. And I just was like, this is great. You're hilarious. You make me laugh. Everything's great. And he's like, I think we have some fundamental differences. I was like, it's going to be fine. And it was not fine. We it's didn't agree fine. on anything anything and he had a lot of like issues with anger that he was not dealing with and it only got worse and then when when my daughter was 18 months old I'd finally had enough because the thing about motherhood I found was like there were things I was willing to put up with and for myself but when it came to my daughter hard stop like yeah. no this is not how I want you to grow up. This is not the experience that I want you to have. I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was done. And we, um, yeah, so I left. He would not leave the house um, that we had. He wouldn't, we had one car. He would not let me use the car. So, <laughs> so I lived in a motel for nine days um, and I ran a business and I was trying to run the business using this enormous computer I was taking to coffee shops and having to like plug into the wall. Um, that was a good was luck. Br <laughs> it was brutal. It was so awful. Um, and so, yeah, like I'd say probably five years after that was just really an intense amount of stress, um, you know, going because I couldn't run that business. It stressed me out to have the variable income. And I so I went back to work and the whole thing with my daughter getting kicked out of daycare and then we had to find a nanny and like 
all the things. It was five years of custody fighting and just horrible. Um, so yeah. So that's stress how that was. Stress upon stress yes. upon pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Yeah. And my daughter was really, really struggling with anxiety, um, in part just because of everything that was changing. I think part of it was like she didn't know when she was gonna see her dad next. Some of it was she was terrified of daycare. She was really, really attached to me. I used to like have to lay with her literally on top of my body for her to go to sleep. And if I even like moved an inch, she would freak out and like immediately jolt awake. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just like searching for anything that could help us. And I, I have a background in psychology and I'm a big, big fan of therapy. And I found a child therapist and I said, basically, like, is too, too young to see a therapist. And this woman was specialized in trauma, um, specialized in just little kids. And she was incredibly helpful to us, basically to me, just talking, mm. teaching me how to communicate more with a kid that, you know, was young and you know, a pre-reader also like, you know, at two, they're not really able to communicate a whole lot. And mm -hmm. I was shocked by how fascinating their little brains are. I would have totally studied kids in school had I known how interesting they were. They're, um, pretty, before, they're pretty great. They're yeah. pretty cool. I, I, don't <laughs> think, I, you know, I didn't have any experience with kids. She was my first, the first baby I ever held was my own. Oh, um, that's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I had no clue how cool kids were until I had her. Yes. They're so underrated. <laughs> they, are, they are so underrated. And we also are so smart. Like they know, so they understand so much more than we think they do, which mm -hmm. is really, it's both cool and it's terrifying. Because once oh, I started yes. to learn that stuff, I was like, oh my God, all the things that she was exposed to in my marriage are just really scary to me that she has, you know, physical memory of how stressful it was and, and yeah. all that. So, so, so yeah. what type of advice did she have for you? Did, did you like meet together? Like, what did that look yes. like? Yes. Yeah. So we, we basically did, um, we did therapy where my daughter and I met with a therapist and did like play therapy and she would basically help me um, communicate with my daughter by validating her feelings, really naming her emotions. The big thing that really changed everything for me was she took out a piece of like um, cardstock, like construction paper stuff and she used a ruler to turn it into a calendar. And she was like, we're going to draw, you know, a mom here and a dad here. So, you know, when you're going to see your dad next and when you're going to see me and then you're going to hang this on your fridge. And I was like, really? Like, that's kind of even like a two year old can understand that. And she was like, oh, yeah, this is like totally a great technique. This is we use this with all kids so they understand when they're going to see us next. And I thought, huh. Well, the business that I ran for six years, I was an illustrator. I got better, cuter things than this. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm on this. <laughs> so I took some drawings that I had done of our family and I turned them into magnets. And I so took cute. like an old magnetic like thing that you put under a refrigerator to catch drips. <laughs> And oh, I yep. turned it over and made a calendar out of electrical tape and this thing and put the magnets on it. And it completely transformed her anxiety. She understood which days she was going to be at school, which days she was going to see her dad for dinner, when we were going to see the therapist. It was it was a game changer. Like, I didn't realize how many things were swirling around in her little head and it's like, now that I've been doing this, because I, I turned that into a business based, not the drip tray, <laughs> but I turned the calendar into a business. And now that I've been doing it for so many years, it really made me realize, like, as humans, the way that we organize ourselves and, like, stress when we're feeling stressed, like, that's why we have these calendars on our phones. And it's like, if yeah. I lost my phone, I would completely flip out. I'd have absolutely no clue what yes. was going to happen to me. And kids are the same. Yes. And we just think like, oh, 
you're going to be fine. I'm going to take you from one thing to the next. And we don't really prepare them for yes. what's happening. And yes. we don't realize that they really need that. Oh, it's, it's so important. Like, where were you four years ago when I made mine for my daughters? Because I'm sure yours have been <laughs> way cuter. <laughs> But like it, it is just something that with my background as a preschool teacher, as you know, home visitor, it just makes sense because yeah, their brains are exactly like ours. And I do like in that for parents where I say like, if you woke up every day and had literally no idea what day of the week it was, if you were working or not, and what was expected of you, what your day looked like, you would have a lot of anxiety. Like yeah. That's terrifying. It's so simple. Yes. And when you do implement just a really, really simple week calendar, which I do with all of my one-on-one clients, it is a game changer. Like no, no frivolous thought. Like we are not exaggerating. (laughs) It genuinely is for kids to be able to have a tangible tool that makes them feel empowered, that makes them feel like they really get their life and can understand those ambiguous time concepts of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it Mm -hmm. makes them feel so much more in control of their own life at two, at four, at six, at eight, like 28, 88. (laughs) We all need it. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And I think the thing that really surprised me is I have people that bought my calendar six years ago for their two-year-old and they are still ordering new things. They're like, oh, "Oh, my kid started martial arts. And I'm like, you have, you have been using this thing for this long and we do too. So it's like, I shouldn't really. Beautiful business model. Genius. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. It's, I, it really keeps me going, you know, to, to know how much it helps families. And, and it shocked me, um, really how much of a difference it made. Yeah. So you had like another life event that made this even more important, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> we talk Tell about, us about survival that. mode. <laughs> yes. Um, so when my daughter was six, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I like sometimes when I play back my life, I'm like, how in the hell? Right? <laughs> did all this stuff happen? <laughs> um, but yeah, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I immediately was like, it was, I was diagnosed on a, at 4 p.m. on a Friday. And I've never been so grateful to be divorced in my life because my daughter was already on her way um, with her dad to his house for the weekend when I was diagnosed. So I was able to just like totally fall apart, right? It was like, I was not expecting it. I, and the doctor (laughs) Doctor, I'm just like, I wish you had not said this. He was like, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking you're going to die. And I was like, actually, I wasn't thinking that. No, <laughs> now I am. I am. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and like the only thing I could think was like I was envisioning my daughter's tearful face at my funeral. Oh. It was horrible. Horrible. So... So, yeah. So uh, they initially thought that I had early stage cancer and that all I was going to need was um, all I was going to need was a was a mastectomy because it took up such a large amount of space that I needed to have my whole breast removed. And then I was like, take them both. Like, I don't want to. I was 34 and I was like, I do not want to be thinking about this. Um, Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when they went in um, to remove it, they found it had spread. So I had to have all my lymph nodes removed on one side, and I went through chemo and radiation, and now I'm on continuing medications to keep it from coming back. But treatment was... It was just kind of amazing to me because my divorce had been so difficult and my parents live in Oregon and I live in Northern California and I called my parents from the doctor's office because they, my dad is a doctor and my mom was a nurse and I could not process anything that was going on with what the doctor was saying to me other than this statement that that you're worried you're going to die. (laughs) Um, And so he explained to my parents, like, what was going on. And I think my mom, like, flew down here. I Like, she drove. But, like, she, it felt like she was there in, like, 10 minutes. And I just remember saying to her, I just really don't want this to be harder than my divorce. 
because the divorce was really horrible. And then I immediately burst into tears and I was like, I was just diagnosed yesterday and this is already way worse. And it was just really like a lot of perspective to me, really humbling because I had lived a very privileged life, you know, despite going through all of this like hardship in my motherhood, you know, I didn't understand the level of suffering that people can go through, that families are going through, and it really opened my eyes to one facet of all of the difficulties. And I just thought, like, there's got to be a way to make this better somehow. And when I was explaining cancer to my daughter, I bought, like, five, six different books, and all of them were not what I wanted. Um, Mm -hmm. I wanted to, because of my understanding of how kids learn and how smart and cool they are, I knew I wanted to explain to her, you know, from a scientific perspective, like, this is what cancer is. Like, we're not going to, like, make up something where there was one book that was called There's a Monster in Mommy. And I was like, that is freaking terrifying. That's so scary. (laughs) No. And I just, I thought like from an, again, from an adult perspective, when you understand what is actually happening, Mm -hmm. it really helps. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, why am I going to, why am I going to sugarcoat this? Or in that case, like terrify the crap out of you by not telling you the truth. And so I basically figured out a way to explain what cancer is to her, um, that basically our, our bodies are made up of itty bitty teeny tiny things that you can't see. And they're kind of like building blocks like Lego, but they can make their own building blocks anytime they need. And so your whole body is built out of these little guys and the little guys can make a new guy anytime they need to. But sometimes one of the guys gets confused and he doesn't know what he's doing and he's broken and he accidentally makes, you know, another broken cell. because, And then he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing. And so all he does is start making more and more broken cells faster and faster and faster until you've got a whole clump of guys that aren't doing their jobs and they don't have any idea what's going on. And they're pushing out the guys that are doing their jobs. And so we have to get rid of them. And she Brilliant. totally understood this because it's yeah. so simple, right? Yeah. She was like, okay how many guys do you have? And I was like, well, I'm, I only have one guy. So all we're going to do is cut him out. And I said, but when you have lots of guys or when the guys like get and move to other parts of your body, cause they can, they can move to other parts of your body. Then there are other medicines and other things that the doctors need to do, but we're just going to cut it, cut him out. And she was like, mm-hmm. is that going to hurt? So I just kind of explained surgery to her where they basically give you a medicine that makes you go to sleep. So you're not in pain. And So, but this also served as a foundation because when I woke up and found out, I actually do have more guys than we thought and they were Mm. on their way to travel somewhere else. So I have to have some of that medicine and, you know, it served as a good foundation. Um, And so I wrote a book um, (laughs) about it because there was nothing out there like that. Um, And that really kind of kicked it off. But I thought like there, this is still so hard. Like once you explain a topic to a kid, like books are fantastic, right? Because, and I think that's why a lot of parents reach for them is because when you're going through something hard or something changes and the kids are really struggling, like the book helps you explain it and it's visual and kids learn that way and they can reference it over and over until they really get it. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if I'm explaining to you what cancer is, you're only going to go through this book so many times. And I thought, like, our lives are just chaos. Like, what is happening? Like, she didn't know who was picking her up from school, who was, you know, going to bring us food, where I was going to be, when she was going to be with her dad. It was just crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that treatment, like, singing is just all over the place. Yes. And it's exhausting. And mm-hmm. and I just felt like I was kind of fading into nothing because I was so tired and I couldn't even come up with ways that we could bond together. Like I used to be the mom that would like play tag on the playground with her. And then suddenly I was too tired to even think of things we could do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just felt awful. Yeah. And she started relying on my mom and my partner, um, which thank God they were there. And, but I was like, this has got to be messing her up. Like everything that we've gone through, I'm just like, how do I make sure she's okay? What do I do? 
I yes, always that's the number therapist. one fear uh, yes. that, of why I created this podcast is because so many moms were saying, I feel like I'm screwing up my kids. I feel yes. like everything I'm doing is failing them, but I'm the only one. Like, right. No, yes. we need to talk about this. Yes, yeah. we do. <laughs> so I immediately was like, find me a therapist. And I went to yeah. uh, cancer support services and I was like, I have a young kid. There is nothing to help me parent her during this. What do I do? And they said, oh, well, there's this woman she works at, you know, blah, blah, blah. She's been working with kids who have lost parents to cancer for 30 years. Um, Email her and see if she has, you know, any availability in her practice. And she wrote back and to my email and was like, you know, I don't have, I'm not seeing people individually anymore. I run this program for children that are, um, have lost parents to anything, suicide, cancer or anything. Um, she said, but she saw the link to my business in my email signature. And she was like, I would love to talk to you about this. And I was almost through my treatment at that point, no longer exhausted. And so I took the stuff to her and I said, you know, this is my calendar for divorce. This is the book I wrote about cancer. I don't really know how to make cancer treatment easier. And she was like, this is brilliant. And then she's like, I think you have your answer right here. You just said life is chaotic and your kid doesn't know what's happening next. You have a calendar. I was like, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Wish I had thought of that in the middle of my treatment. But again, I was so tired. Yeah, your brain was not there. (laughs) No, my brain was not there. So I created a calendar for cancer that basically is like, here's all the things that your parent may be feeling. Here's, you know, a... Thing to show who's doing school drop off and school pickup. Um, here's like 15 really quiet activities that a parent can set a 15 minute timer for, and the kid can then choose an activity to do with their parents to have something to look forward to. Love. Um, it was a game changer because when I put it out there, I mean, all of my the people in my community were like, "Holy crap!" You know, I had gone to this like breast cancer summit. And it was for young survivors. There were 600 women in the same room and no one was talking about parenting. And I was like, how is no one talking about this? We're in this like sponsor room where everybody is walking around picking up pens and like, you know, chapstick with the pink ribbon on it and all this crap just to take home to their kids. And no one is talking about parenting. And so it really filled a hole. Um Huge and it, hole it, and huge yeah. needed hole. And yeah. and in breast cancer, it's like, you know, every breast cancer survivor seems to come up with some idea to help other breast cancer um, survivors. And the thing that I've really come to realize is breast cancer is a really survivable cancer. And that's why. And mm. you have people that have more terrifying types of cancer, which was, by the way, the point that doctor was trying to make was like, I know you feel like you're going to die, but breast cancer is super survivable. (laughs) Didn't catch the end of that sentence. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Did not catch the end of that. Um, It's fine. (laughs) So my whole point was like, I do not want this to be for breast cancer. I want this to be for cancer. So the Mm -hmm. books that I've written, the calendar, all of it works for all types of cancers, whether it's leukemia or, you know, colon cancer, like any of these types of cancers, like the book explains how cancer works from a scientific perspective. And so it's good for all, all different types of diagnoses. And the other thing I didn't realize, which was kind of interesting is that people were using my book. It's called What Happens When Someone I Love Has Cancer. They're using it for siblings of kids who have cancer because a lot of children who have a sibling with cancer are dealing with total chaos in their household and they're necessarily kind of pushed to the side as the family rallies around the child who has cancer. And so a lot of child life specialists, these are the people in the children's hospitals who really work with the family, were giving that book to to siblings. And I only learned that because I got really involved with 
child life specialists when I was contacted by a couple of parents who had children with brain tumors. And they said, you know, this is a really cool thing that you've created for parents who have cancer. But, you know, my kid has cancer herself or himself. Like, could you make one for kids? And so I did. And so it's become a whole, a whole really cool and rewarding thing to be able to help all of these different groups of people who are dealing with like the hardest thing they could ever face. Shittiest circumstances ever. For sure. I mean, you want to talk about feeling like you're failing your kid. It's like, my kid has cancer. What, how do I, how do I get through this? Yeah. No, that's like a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Awful. Well, I'm your biggest fan. I think what you created (laughs) is so amazing and so needed that it was not even a question of like wanting, wanting to support you in any way I could just because I know with the families I work with that are, you know, have that have typically developing kids that have healthy parents also benefit so much from this simple calendar and simple books that straight up just explain why life feels a little bit crazy right now, whatever that reason is, you need to have those conversations. Kids need to feel like they understand what's going on and that they have some agency and some control over their life, even if it doesn't change the actual actual circumstances of the chaos that is ensuing. It makes it feel so much more manageable when it's put on a calendar where you know what tomorrow looks like. And totally. being able to have that connection with your kids where – they feel like they can come to you and get answers and that you're explaining things in a more of a level than you think that they would understand because that's where where their capability is at, then it creates such a strong relationship that is so much healthier that can survive these really shitty circumstances. And I just think that that's so important that every family could benefit from 15 minutes of a one-on-one simple game. And every family could benefit from having a calendar for each child in their life circumstances. So whatever that looks like for, you know, your families that are listening to this, um, even if, you know, you haven't gone through something like this in your own family, even yet, because you never know, I I think definitely know that you can either send this to a family because everybody's been affected by cancer in one way, shape, or form. Send this to a family that you know could absolutely use it right now. And, you know, consider what that would look like even for your family because I I really do feel like the little people in our life are just begging for tools that help them feel like they know what's going on. And when we really meet that need for them, we can just see them thrive. And that's where we really can tap into, you know, that whole idea of kids are resilient. No, (laughs) they're not, actually. They're actually really easily traumatized by simple things um, because they're so impressionable and their brain is forming at such a quick rate. It's actually a huge pressure for us, Um, and that's why we do feel like we're feeling. But there are really, really simple ways that we can straight up nail some things for our kids Mm -hmm. and meet them where they're at in a way that's really transformative and powerful that makes us feel like we're kind of awesome parents for like one minute for like one <laughs> yeah totally yeah i think we all kind of learned that during the pandemic too right it's like oh, when that yes. routine and stuff gets messed up i think something that i i immediately recognized right is like okay school went from being every day to all of a sudden we're not coming back from spring break yeah and all WTF. of a sudden some kids are doing school in person some kids are doing sk- school at, at home so immediately i was like okay y'all need a calendar yeah <laughs> and and it's like there's you know just showing them when school days are when online school is and then now transitioning hopefully out of that just to show them which days are school days which days are the weekends when they're going to have play dates when their after school activities are Yes. Um, yeah, it makes an exactly. enormous difference in every family, whether your kid has anxiety or just is a regular kid. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and your kids. 10-year-old still uses hers? She does. Yeah, it's totally – she loves it. It's also dry erase, which she makes is. it fun because, you yeah. know, once the kids start reading and you're like, I don't have a button for – you know, this totally <laughs> random Minecraft yes. camp you're doing. You know, <laughs> it helps. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, my, my kids, you know, are all about writing on when they have hot lunch now. So that's their thing that they're responsible for adding oh, to their yeah. calendar. Because those days that are definitely sense. worth looking forward to. Some sort of dessert. That's the only reason they picked that day. <laughs> <laughs> but, you hot know, it's lunch, little that's things. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Life is all about the little things. It totally is. Yes. So what do you feel like, if I were to give you a, a pedestal that says, like, what do you feel like most parents need to hear from your life experience, what would that be? Don't be so hard on yourself, you know, and really try to make things easier. I think we tend to look to the future a lot about, you know, how is what's happening right now going to mess them up? How is, you know... What can I, I need to schedule all the things. And I think the thing that I really learned when I was diagnosed with cancer is it has a way of really like clearing your plate of all this stuff that you've like put on it and what's left is what's really important. And Mm -hmm. for me and for most parents, I think it's that connection you have with your kids and Really, the thing that I think I did really well during cancer was I did 15 minutes of special time every night at bedtime where non-negotiable, she gets to choose what we do, what we talk about, and she just came and hung out with me in bed. And that really kept our relationship going and being able to do things together. Like, if if I only had one day left, like, I would spend it with her. So yeah, planning all this other crap, like you know, and worrying about whether they're going to get into college. Like we all, this is their path to walk. Mm -hmm. They're going to, there's going to be things that we didn't do right. Yep. That they're going to have to recover (laughs) from because nobody is perfect. Right. So just be easier on yourself and apologize when you mess up, you know, do the best you can and just build that relationship. Yes. I love this message. I'm, yes, good job. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, uh, so agree. <laughs> so tell tell us where we can connect with your work, you know, where listeners can find you. And then I have one, one, one last question for you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, my business is Mighty and Bright. You can find me on Instagram at Mighty and Bright Co. That's basically, I have my own Instagram too, but that's really where I hang out is uh, Mighty and Bright Co. Love it. Definitely go check that out. I'll, I'll have all of her links in the show notes. Um, so go find that after you're done listening. And, you know, the, the question we've all been waiting for is how are you the mom that your daughter needs? I think I have turned into the mom my daughter needs by just meeting her where she is. And that has been everything from, you know, she was allergic to everything under the sun as a baby you know, she was afraid of shadows on the ground and sand when she was a toddler. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, I have met her where she is and tried to be um, as empathetic as possible because kids are not melting down or having issues because they're bad kids. You know, they're having issues because they're having a hard time. Yes. And they don't have perspective. They don't have, you know, a life of, you know, experience to look back and say, this is not the worst thing that could happen. Like to them, it is literally the worst thing that could happen to them. And they need somebody to hold them while, you know, while they're dealing with it. And that's, that's our job. So it's really helped me to, to be the mom that she needs by really understanding that she's, she's just struggling and I needed to be there for her. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. All of this. <laughs> I literally say that all the time, like word for word, verbatim. I didn't, I didn't even feed you these lines. <laughs> I think this is why we connected on Instagram because yes, I was yes, like, oh yes, my that's my person. <laughs> I love it. No, seriously. I think when you have that perspective, it genuinely is a game changer in those moments of just re- being able to reframe. It doesn't, again, mm-hmm. make it any easier or change the meltdown or whatever is happening. But just having that perspective, uh, they're not a bad kid. They're just having a hard time. And it's not personal. And we don't have to make it reflect how good we're doing. They're not our report card. They are Mm -hmm. just living their own life. And we have to meet them where they're at. And they're asking for help. They really are. And we're the grown-up. That's what we're here to do. Even if we don't always 
do it perfectly. We definitely yeah. don't. <laughs> and it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. Yes. It's okay to apologize. It's okay to be like, I didn't handle that the way I wish that I had. All you're doing by apologizing is modeling for them that it's okay to not be perfect, which for crying out loud, if there's a lesson <laughs> I want my daughter to have, it's to be more like forgiving of herself for not being perfect. Mm. Yes. Um, I am not helping anybody by pretending that I'm perfect. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's not talked about enough. For sure. For 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 girls growing up. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Okay, well that amazing. I am so glad that I met you. I'm sad I didn't meet you up until this year because yes, with COVID and everything, like you your work is so 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 needed and and just has even more reasons to expand and grow with families that need, that need it. But um, thank you for taking the time to share with us today. And I just so appreciate your um, your willingness to go out and make the thing that hasn't existed yet, because that is the ingenuity of women business owners and breast cancer survivors and all of the people that are just warriors. Just I just can't, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Danielle. This has been really wonderful. Awesome. Okay. Are you as sold on the idea as I am? Go jump to her website, find a calendar or a book that is really going to fit your family's needs or send it to a family that you know could really, really benefit and support Sarah and her work. And um, thank you for your support of this podcast and for listening and for being the mom that your kids need. I'm so, so, so glad that you are here. If you haven't yet, go leave a review for Failing Motherhood on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to join my mailing list if you haven't yet. I have a free Calm Big Emotions guide at parentingwholeheartedly.com slash emotions and go download yours um, today. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. I believe in you and I'm cheering you on. Bye.